I was laughing with friends when the conversation turned serious. Somebody mentioned a friend of a friend who died by suicide. The familiar nausea rose in my chest. I just don't understand what would make someone think that's the only option. I swallowed hard and let out the breath I'd been holding. I do. I completely get that. I've been there. They stared, eyes wide. Finally, he asked what it's like to want to die. So I told them about the pain, the exhaustion, the constant rattling fear. I said it felt like dying of a terrible disease and wishing I could hurry it up because things would only get worse. Depression and suicide are still taboo in our culture, so it's no wonder my friends were shocked. But the stigma is even greater in the church. As Christians, we are called to be the light of the world, a refuge for the broken and weary. But we can't reach people in this darkness if we don't understand it. So here are some things you need to know about suicide and depression. It's not just mental and emotional. We might not even be sad. The phrase mental illness makes it seem like it's just in our heads, but it's not. Depression is deeply physical. For many, chest pain leads people to believe they're having heart attacks while migraines, stomach problems, and a weakened immune system are all common symptoms. I usually notice brain fog and memory problems first, then some unexplained irritation and the bone-deep weariness. In my worst seasons, I couldn't eat because of constant nausea and my skin burned like every nerve was on fire. Now this is controversial, but it's important. Suicidal people are not being selfish. While I desperately wanted to make the pain stop, dying also seemed like the most selfless thing to do. The intense shame and self-hatred can make us believe we're toxic, so it seemed like dying would be a blessing to those close to us. Of course, that's not how it feels if you've lost someone to suicide. It probably feels like your loved one didn't consider how it would shatter you to lose them, how it would leave you with so many unanswered questions. But even so, calling suicide selfish only reinforces the shame of those who are afraid to ask for help. It's not because we don't pray, read our Bibles, or serve God wholeheartedly. The darkness doesn't care how faithful we are in our spiritual disciplines or how much we serve others. It attacks indiscriminately. And yet many Christians believe prayer and Bible study alone will restore mental health. I learned early on that if God didn't make me better, I lacked faith and it was my fault. The miracle-focused church I attended taught God would give us whatever we asked for in faith. But no matter how I recited verses, asked for healing, and served others in ministry, I wasn't miraculously healed. I was still hurting, still hopeless, and my despair only mounted until I saw no other way out. Thankfully, God chose to work through pills and skilled professionals, with prayer and reading hope-filled scripture as crucial parts of my self-care plan. God is still the ultimate source of healing, even if He doesn't do it miraculously. We also can't just choose joy or stop thinking about it. Sometimes Christians tell us to choose joy to get out of depression. But when death seems like the only way out of an internal torture chamber, that doesn't work. Instead, we decide choose joy means mask the pain. That's why big smiles so often hide deep despair. Saying things like, I'm so sorry you're hurting, and spending time with people struggling is much more effective than telling them to choose joy. Suicidal thoughts are intrusive. They show up whether we want them or not, like a horror movie playing in our heads. Several years ago, I was part of an incredible church, co-directing a nonprofit and serving in the youth ministry. One tough Sunday, I stood alongside my students in worship, doing everything I could to turn my eyes upon Jesus. 
I told him I loved him and I would praise him anyway, even if I always felt like that. But when I closed my eyes, all I could see was an image of my body swinging from the rafters. And I didn't tell anyone. See, we know we're not supposed to have these thoughts, so we don't tell. We are well aware that suicidal thoughts are uncomfortable and even frightening for people to talk about. So we fight to suppress them, telling ourselves not to think such hideous things. We might even believe God has forsaken us because we're so bad. The disease lies. When healing doesn't come, it's easy to believe God has left us. And if we've been taught that depression and suicidal thoughts are sinful, selfish, or displeasing to God, we may believe He's right in abandoning us. This is why we need to treat depression and suicide with the same compassion we treat other serious health issues. Kindness and encouragement from other believers are rich and powerful. They prove the presence of God and demonstrate His unshakable love to us. What Christians need to know is that we can deeply, desperately, wholeheartedly love Jesus and still be depressed. You aren't a bad Christian when you struggle with dark thoughts. You are beloved and you belong in the family of God. You are not disqualified from living a full, joyful life even in the midst of depression. Yes, it will require hard work and professional support, but you can do it. I know because I've walked that path. I take my meds, spend time with Jesus, and go to therapy faithfully. I talk to safe people when I'm hurting, and I prioritize self-care because it allows me to love and serve others well. Your life doesn't have to be defined by the darkness. There is hope and help for you, too. If you're not struggling, you need to know it's easier to save a life than you think. Once, I believed my death would be a blessing to others. But I'm still here because one friend noticed something was wrong and did something about it. She invited me to dinner, took me along to pick blackberries with her kids, and reminded me how important I was to her family. She told me she loved me, that it wasn't my fault I was broken, and God wasn't mad at me for hurting. She was simply present in my pain. On a hot July night, when I was tired of fighting to stay alive, I showed up on her doorstep because I knew it was a safe place, and her family walked with me through the dark. My friend showed me Emmanuel, God with us, when I needed him most. She helped me believe I was loved and that my life mattered. So often, all it takes to save a life is being Jesus to the hurting, just being present being loving and being light. You don't need to have answers and you don't need to be able to fix it. You just need to be there, perhaps to help set the doctor's appointment or even to just listen. Just be aware of those hurting. Just be kind. Depressed and suicidal people simply need you to enter the dark and sit beside us with unchanged love. You could be his arms to hold us, his hands to feed us, and His voice to tell us we're not alone. Your love and kindness are more powerful than you know. Depression and suicide are serious issues, and my heart breaks with those of you facing them. If you need to talk, or you know somebody struggling, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255 or text with someone 24 hours a day at the Crisis Text Line by texting HOME to 741741.